tồn tại tốt lết hay là tiểu sản thùy nhọng vì hai bên tiên lượng hoàn toàn khác nhau thì nó rất là khó tại vì cái góc thùy nhọng nó không hề bị di lệch gì hết nó vẫn ở vị trí bình thường nhưng mà cái kích thước nó nhỏ thì cuối cùng cái ca này làm em ra thì sẽ thấy cái thùy nhọng nó bị nhỏ tất nhiên có một số trường hợp các anh chị khó khăn thì các anh chị cần có cái sự hỗ trợ em ra thì như vậy đây là một cái trường hợp là thiểu sản thuyền nhọn thì tóm lại đối với cái bài bất thường hố sau thì nguyên muốn nói là nhắc lại các anh chị đây là một cái vấn đề thường gặp và cái dạng bị lớn hố sau đơn thuần cái tiêu chuẩn chẩn đoán khá là dễ nhưng mà chị phải cắt dọc lại để các chị đánh giá thuyền nhọn cái đang đi quốc cơ man phật mason là một cái thể nặng các anh chị cũng dễ nhưng mà thật sự là nó nó khó, nó quá rõ ràng cho nên chẩn đoán không khó cái vấn đề khó đó là cái sự toàn vẹn của thuyền nhọn để các anh chị phân biệt giữa tồn tại bú lết là tiên lượng rất tốt và một bên là thiểu sản thuyền nhọn là nó sẽ ảnh hưởng đến những cái rối loạn hành vi cho nên cái vấn đề hố sau nó khó nhất là cái đánh giá thuyền nhọn mà nhiều ca nguyên cũng gửi cho thầy philip santi và thầy cũng hỗ trợ trong chẩn đoán và thầy nói cái câu là tôi rất ghét là vẹt mít ai hết hay vẹt mít thầy nói với nguyên như vậy là các anh chị thấy là đánh giá cái vẹt mít nó rất là khó cho nên đó là một cái rất là quan trọng để mà để đánh giá phân biệt giữa tồn tại túi lết và một cái thiểu sản thuy nhọn dạ, xin cảm ơn sự lắng nghe của các anh chị à, xin cảm ơn thạc sĩ bác sĩ hà tố nguyên đã giới thiệu về cái bất thường hệ thần kinh trung ương bất thường hố sau là cái bất thường hay gặp nhất về, về cái siêu âm tiền sản và ngoài cái phần giới thiệu hình ảnh thì báo cáo viên còn giới thiệu giúp cho chúng ta những cái kỹ thuật để có thể phát dễ dàng phát hiện và phân biệt với lại những các cái trường hợp khác thì tiếp theo chúng ta chuyển sang cái bản báo cáo thứ hai báo cáo của thầy Philip Santi là bất thường đường giữa midline anomaly thì tôi cũng xin giới thiệu một chút về thầy Philip Santi giáo sư Philip Santi là giám đốc đơn vị siêu âm ở cái trung tâm hình ảnh săn sóc về các cái vấn đề bất thường uh, có di chuyển ở bang Tennessee, Mỹ và giáo sư Genty là người sáng lập cái trang web uh, thì uh, yeah, uh, thì uh, net và đây là giáo sư có nhiều kinh nghiệm trong lĩnh vực siêu âm sản dị tật và sàng lọc trước sinh uh, xin kính mời uh, giáo sư Philip Chanty please Good morning so we're going to talk about two of the topics in the central nervous system analysis and I'm going to start with the midline cyst now what is the process to think when you find a cyst inside the baby's head what is the characteristic? So let me start to go back and back and back. So the first question is that, is it just a cyst or is it a different type of fluid collection? So let's assume it is just a cyst. And then the question is, is this exactly midline or is it not exactly midline? So let's first start with an exactly midline cyst. And then we have the choice between these four groups. So let's start with the cavum septum pellucidum and the cavum vergi. So these will be exactly central like this, and they usually communicate together. So you, when you have a cavum vergi, it appear has a prolongation, a posterior aspect of the cavum septum pellucidum, and this is what you see with ultrasound. You see this big uh, cyst in the middle, it's more visible when you do the central section, but I'm looking here only in the coronal section. The next type of cyst you can find is an interferospheric cyst. And this, as you can see, is very strongly associated with this genesis of the corpus callosum, which we'll talk about later on. And so there you think about a herniated third ventricle that pushes in between the interhemispheric fissure uh, you can also have neuroenteric cysts, acrine cysts, and epidemical cysts. So the appearance here 
is a cyst that is strictly midline in between the two hemispheres. Now, another uh, type of cyst you can find is a cavum villi interpositi, and these are more posterior, and it's in the space above the telechoridae and the ventricle, and it's between the columns of the fornix that are in the posterior aspect, and if you do an ultrasound, this is what it will appear in the posterior aspect. Next, I wanted to show you the arachnoid cyst, and as you can know, arachnoid cysts only develop on the surface of the brain, on the arachnoid, although you can see that the arachnoid can invaginate itself in many areas, so it will not be inside the meat of the brain, it will be on the sides, outside of the brain. And there will be subarachnoid, so at the periphery of the gray matter of the brain. And the most common area is the ciliary fissure, the posterior area. And look when in the posterior area to differentiate them from Danny Walker cysts. So uh, you use the algorithm that Nguyen gave you in the previous uh, lecture. They do not dis uh, they displace, but they do not disrupt the cortex. It's an important differential diagnosis with the Parsifex cysts. So the appearance here will be some cysts that are on the surface here and displacing the uh, brain itself, but not destructing the brain. So now we've explored this branch, let's go back and let's say, no, it's not exactly midline. So uh, now we're faced with three choices. Great plexus cyst, superbendal cyst, and again arachnoid cyst. Uh, great plexus cyst, I'm sure you have seen a million of them. Uh, this is something that used to be very important 20 years ago. Now we don't pay too much attention, but remember the association with trisomy 18, 21, and with time factor. And of course, this is the appearance of great plexus cyst. Sometimes when they're quite symmetrical, they may not be so visible because they appear to be a section through the uh, lateral ventricle, but so pay attention to the symmetrical one. Subependimal cysts, there are several of them. The least likely to define are the conatal cysts, which are adjacent to the superlateral margin of the body and the frontal horns, and they can be a normal variant. So if you look over here, we have this little cyst, which is at the edge of the lateral ventricle. Remember this image because I'm going to show some differential diagnosis in the next slide. The next one, which are much more common, are the sub cysts, and these are the sequela of a bleed, and I could show you the bleeds later on, but I don't know that I will have time. And this is a sequela of germinal axis. So this is the appearance of those cysts, and you can see here we have the uh, ventricle, and just under the side of the ventricle, we have those uh, two lists. So this baby at some point had some bleeding in the general matrix. Now remember there's a gradation of grade 1, 2, 3, 4. If you have a grade 4 bleed, there will be an intraparenchymal extension of that bleed, and the result of this intraparenchymal extension is going to be a much different cyst, which is what you see over here. These have a much worse prognosis, and they are bigger, they are more peripheral, and they are more superior than the other one. And then we had also seen the arachnoid cyst, so we can go back out of that. So now we had seen the midline or not midline, so we do back in the differential diagnosis and say it's not just a cyst, there's something more than just a cyst. So the next question is the cavum septum pollicidum present? So let's say it's present. Is there an interventric fissure? Let's assume there's an interventric fissure. And then the next question is, do you see the corpus callosum? Okay, let's say it's there. So the next question is, is there ventricular megaly? Yes. And then you have either mild or ventricular megaly. Mild ventricular megaly, as you remember, is an atrial measurement less than 15 millimeter. And this is what you see over here. We have some slight extension of the ventricles. I can see the 
civil wars have been really steady. You see also there's some German on ISIS here, and there's some some ephemeral uh, cysts. This is typically after a bleed. The bleed not only uh, causes some obstruction of the granulation of Pacioni, but it also obstructs the conductors of silvers, and so you have several reasons to develop hydrocephalus. Or you can have a real ventricular medley, and then the question is, uh, the days, uh, do we have a dilatation of the ventricle hydrocephaly, or do we have atrophy of the cortex? So you can have large ventricle for two reasons. Either you have increased pressure, which is ventricular medley, or you have uh, atrophy of the cortex. You can also put color, because in color you can see that this baby may have actually a vein of galen ectasia. So important to use color when you do that. So here would be an example of that. You see distended ventricles, they communicate here in the middle, and then we go into all the differential diagnoses of the holoprosencephaly and the back. Let's go back in here. And let's say there was no ventricle medley, and then is the brain parenchyma intact? Okay, yes, the brain parenchyma is intact. Then we have to differentiate between the septoopic dysplasia and absence of the cavum septopolicinum. So let's go for septoopic dysplasia. So here we have no cavum septopolicinum, and we have fusion of the lateral ventricle in the midline. And this is uh, very similar to what we see in Holoprosin Severly. And this would be an ultrasonic image. That you see the two ventricles are communicating, and you see there's an intermittent fissure, intermittent fissure in between. So, this is septoptic dysplasia, and a very difficult di di differential diagnosis is absence of the cavum septopolucidum in which you have also emerging, but this has a much better prognosis. So here we have an intermittent fixture and the forks that are present. We may have some corpus callosum, we should have corpus callosum. Uh, and what you want to think here is schizencephaly, septoptic dysplasia, some holoprosencephaly, hydrocephalus can also do uh, an image like that. So a big differential diagnosis when you look at that, and here's an example of septoptic dysplasia, where you see the merging of the two, and you see the uh, intermittent fissure, which is present in between. So let's go back out of that, and let's say the brain parenchyma is not intact. So if it's not intact, do we still have gray matter or not? Let's assume that the gray matter is present. Then you go back to the subependymal cyst that we saw earlier, go to parencephaly, which is a result of an infarction or defect or schizencephaly. So let's try for encephaly. So here we have a large cysts and those cysts can be divided essentially into two groups. Those that have communication with the external aspect of the brain, so they communicate with the sub space, and those that communicate with the ventricle, so they have an internal communication. And often you want to look for some little septation between these. So this typically are going to be cystic degeneration of encephalomalacia from ischemia, hemorrhage, infection, and they will result in a hypoebric lesion afterwards. So the ultrasound image here will be some big defect lacunae, and then you try to see whether they communicate in more the ventricle or remove the subarachnoid space, as in this case here. Now, the next differential diagnosis here would be schizencephaly. Now, schizencephaly is classically divided into two groups. Those that have open limb schizencephaly, which is by far the majority of those that we see prenatally, and there we have a big brain gap, and this is typically resulting from a middle cerebral artery occlusion or a middle cerebral artery infarct. And these are very simple to recognize with ultrasound. They can be unilateral or bilateral. And um, you can have the basket handle, and I cover this in a different segment. Now, there's another type called the closed limb, in which there's just a thin line defect that communicates between the separating space and the lateral ventricle. And this has almost never been diagnosed.
grenade range. So this is a much rarer case. And so this is one of the reasons why ultrasound is not sufficient. You may have to do uh, MRI on these babies to look for the closed lip version. So let's go back now and let's say the gray matter is absent. Well now of course we're talking about a very bad disorder. We're talking about hydrocephaly. And here fundamentally the entire brain has uh, disappeared. And if you catch it early on, you will see the baby's brain liquefied. So you have low level echo and the brain has kind of liquefied. This happens usually after bilateral occlusion or infarction in the territory of the internal uh, cerebral arteries. Now, importantly, in hydrocephaly, you preserve the forks, so you preserve something in this region, which is important in the differential diagnosis with alobar holoprosencephaly. And here's an example. You can see a big black spot inside the head. There is some fusion of the thalamar, but you have a little bit of interhemispheric pressure which is present. Watch out that it's easy to confuse an interhemispheric fissure with some cyclo artifact. So you have to reorient and see from different angles to make sure that you truly have a midline versus no midline because it will change the diagnosis to a low bar and separately. So we have explored this here. Let's go back one level and let's assume that the brain parenchyma is not intact now. Now, is there some gray matter? Well, Again, we go back and do this, we'll go back one, the gray matter is absent. Again, we go back to hyperencephaly. So we go back one more time, one more time. And uh, is there ventricular megaly? Now, let's say there is no ventricular megaly. And then we go back to the same uh, differential diagnosis. Okay? So this is a differential diagnosis that allow you to go into the different uh, Version. So here, absent interrestric fissure. Now, when we have absent interrestric fissure, we are going into the oligosencephaly. And I'm going to cover this in the eventual induction in the next presentation. So let me save that for that moment. Uh, so I think we have explored all the different regions here. So let me go back to the main menu. And we're going to look now at the topic of the ventral induction uh, defect. So, ventral induction. So let's start with the cases of this genesis of the corpus callosum. And with the genesis of the corpus callosum, the one that we see much more frequently is the total absence. So here we have zero communication between the two hemisphere the fiber of white matter that should have been connecting the two hemispheres of the brain fail to develop transversely and they become longitudinally oriented. And I'll show you this as uh, in image later on. It's called the props bundle. Now, this happens to be a disorder of the cilia. This is the ciliopathy. And this is a topic which is developing. And so we spend just two seconds to show you what the ciliopathies are. Cilia are elements inside the cells and they are involved in the motion and the transport of different elements inside the cell. And in the case of ciliopathy, what we have is we have gene defect that go to either a defective protein or this is a defective morphology or a defective protein that results in an abnormal function of those cilia. Because of that, the element inside the cell don't move properly. And as you can see, the cilia being part of all the different cells, they may be associated with many different types of disorder. And many genes are involved. So many of these conditions, which we used to classify by timing of occurrence, are now classified by pathway of defect. <coughs> so among the ciliopathy, you can see have very different conditions. Here we have Schubert syndrome, uh, which is the Fermi aplasia, the molar tooth uh, appearance, but we can have Cartagener, uh, we can have Cytos inversus, isomerism, which we're going to be discussing uh, later this morning, polycystic kidney disease. So you see, this is a very wide set of disorder due to this different pathway that are damaged. So we'll review this also when we do the 
uh, should be a syndrome. Now, why do we have the defect? Most of the time, it's multiple genes that are involved, but some toxic alcohol and cocaine can also affect the cytopathy. Then you can have cytomegalovirus, virus, which is a very common uh, reason to get disease of proposcalosum. And then you have metabolic errors, so the non ketotic non ketotic hypoglycemia, and then the pervasive development disorder, which is essentially the autism spectrum and the red syndrome. So a wide reason of anomaly you can have there. Now, what are the different appearance? Well, if you look first, a total genesis, you don't have the corpus callosum. And because you don't have the corpus callosum, the uh, gyri that was supposed to be parallel to the corpus callosum are not forming, and they will be oriented radially. So you have these radially oriented uh, falls, and you don't have the septal pellucid. So when compared to the normal, there's a big difference here, and that is something that you can detect using the central section that Nguyen showed you in the previous presentation. Now, instead of having a full corpus callosum, you may also have an anterior dysgenesis. So you see here, the genu of the corpus callosum is missing, or you can have a posterior dysgenesis, the splenium is missing, you can have hypoplasia with very thin corpus callosum, and there are some measurements that have been published in the literature, so you can see the different size. And then you can also have this genesis in which you have a ratty looking uh, corpus callosum. It's irregular, some places are thin, some places are thick. So these are the different forms to look for. Now, if you look with the ultrasound, or you have several sections that you typically use. If you go in the transventricular section, this is what you should see in the normal uh, fetus. You should see the two ventricles that have this normal shape that we're used to. And if you compare the normal to the dysgenesis of the corpus callosum, now you have the teardrop shape of the ventricle. So you have what is called corpocephaly with the occipital horn larger than the frontal horn, and the occipital horn are closer together than the frontal horn. And when you do an ultrasound image of that, you see the distension of the frontal horns with the pointy shape of the anterior aspect. And you also see because of that, because the corpus callosum is not there to attach to the sphere together, you see that the frontal lobes are more separate. So you have this wide internal hemispheric fissure. So this is what you see in the transventricular plane. If you go into the transdynamic plane, this is the normal uh, image. You should see those comma shaped frontal horn, you should see the cavernous of the pellucidum, and you should see the occipital horn in the posterior aspect of the image. And when you have cases of dysgenesis of corpus callosum, first you're missing the corpus, you're missing the cavernous of the pellucidum, and the anterior horn are going to be parallel instead of diverging. And of course, they are uh, more close than they should be, and then you have dilatation of the occipital horn. And when you look at the ultrasound, you see those parallel horns here. You see no cavum septum pellucidum, but you see a large third ventricle. So be careful not to confuse the large third ventricle for the cavum septum pellucidum. Once you have then these two uh, transventricular trisalamic view, you can go into the coronal view. And this is what you expect to see in the coronal view. As it has shown you, you should see the corpus callosum bridging the two interhemispheric distance, and you should see a thin interhemispheric fissure. In this genesis of the corpus callosum, what you have is a wide interhemispheric fissure. You see that the third ventricle is not delimited superiorly by the corpus callosum, and so it extends higher than it would normally do and you see a wide separation of the anterior horn. And this is the ultrasound appearance, where you see the high riding third ventricle, you see the wide separation of the anterior horn, you see the wide interim is fixture uh, with three lines at this level. And then finally, the other section you can get is after the coronal section, is the central section. Now we're cutting front to back, and instead of seeing the corpus callosum and the precolosal gyrus, MMF, and the normal distribution of the uh, arteries in this genesis of the corpus callosum, you have those radial folds, 
and you have a membrane source soup, and you have not the normal distribution of the percolosal uh, artery. And with ultrasound, what you see, you have to do Doppler, and then you see instead of the nice curve of the callosal and percolosal and callosal marginal artery, you don't see this anymore, you just see radial folds that come from the center. So these are the views that you will try to get when you do uh, this examination. So here we have wide separation of the hemisphere. You see three lines instead of seeing one line. Uh, there is uh, a teardrop configuration, which is easy to see. You see the pointy frontal horn, and you see the corpocephaly in the back. And here, when you look at the uh, semicolon view, you see the third ventricle here is almost touching the forks. The third ventricle should not be touching the forks, there should be some space in between because you should have the corpus callosum at this level. So these are the findings you want to look in this region. Then, here's another example. You see the corpus cephaly with a wide occipital horn, the pointy uh, frontal horn, and you see that these frontal horns are parallel to each other. They are not diverging like normal frontal horns. They are held to each other. And when you do a sagittal section, you see those lines here are the radiating a, a gyri instead of being uh, oriented alongside the corpus callosum. So that's a different image that you have to try to get for this sagittal section. Another example of corpus cephaly, you see the extended posterior horn, you see the pointy anterior horn. And you see that instead of the normal radiation of uh, vessels, you have this kind of bizarre disorganization of the vessels. So these are easy signs to organize, but you have to pay attention and you have to look at the uh, proper section. Here we see no gender of the corpus callosum, and we see uh, no corpus callosum between the left and right hemisphere. And again, we see this organization of the gyra, typical of a genesis, the corpus callosum. Now, the internal sphic fissure uh, is not retained by the corpus callosum, and so the third ventricle can extend more symphatically, more uh, rostrally, and it can separate and cause an internal sphic cyst. And I'll show you in a second, there are two types of intermesphic cysts, whether they connect or they don't connect with the third ventricle. So, here we have, oops, sorry, went too fast. So here we have a large intermesphic uh, fissure uh, cyst. You see this big cyst separating the hemisphere. You see the corpus cephaly over here, and you see the uh, organization here of the intermesphic cyst and the teardrop configuration. So this is a classical form of the intermesphic cyst. <laughs> Again here, you see uh, three lines between, in the middle here, you should, should not see three lines, you should see only one line. You see the teardrop shape of the lateral ventricle, you see those three lines, very characteristic. Uh, this gives you the diagnosis of a genesis of corpus callosum, so you can be pretty confident of the diagnosis you made. So I mentioned to you the cross bundle, which are those axons that instead of crossing over from one side to the other, don't have the mass communities in order to bridge, and because of that, they cannot cross over, and they go longitudinally, and then they cross those uh, bundles over here. And this is an MRI image uh, with tractography, something we cannot do with our son. Another example where having uh, MRI is useful in the diagnosis. Now, sometimes you can see some widening of the uh, uh, space between the frontal wall because of this cross bundle that are displacing the medial wall naturally. But this is actually not a very easy observation to make. But when you see the corpus cephaly here, uh, this is something that you can think to try to recognize. 
Now, here we're going from top to bottom in the volume. You can see the intermetric uh, assist. You can see the three lines. You can see the wide separation of one hemisphere compared to the other hemisphere. And here in the corner section, again, we see the separation and the cysts in between and no corpus callosum bridging the two hemispheres. So, uh, very secure diagnosis here. Here, another complication that can happen, you can have lipoma or the corpus callosum. So you have this bionicogenic uh, fatty tissue tumor that is at the level where the gene of the corpus callosum could be. Now, the intermetric cyst can be divided into a type 1, which is a diverticular or an extension of the third ventricle, or a type 2, in which the cyst is loculated and not communicating with the lateral ventricle. So, yeah, you may try to recognize one from the other, which with ultrasounds is not quite as easy as it is with MRI. So, here another example we have a thin uh, cable symptom pellucidum. Uh, we have a dilated third ventricle, and we have some wide uh, anterior bone that are parallel to each other. We see some random organization of the folds and of the uh, uh, pericolosal artery. And you can see here that we have a portion of the anterior corpus callosum, but we're missing a portion of the distal corpus callosum. So, uh, in partial dysgenesis of corpus callosum, it's a bit more difficult to recognize than in genesis. It's easy to confuse partial dysgenesis for a normal corpus callosum. <laughs> Here's another example. You can see that the corpus callosum is too thin for the anterior portion and next to the genu, but you see the body of the corpus callosum and the splenium are not seen. Uh, another example of a baby here that has French syndrome uh, with hypoplasia of the corpus callosum. So, after this, let's go into the topic of the holoprotencephaly. And holoprotencephaly can present with a great variety of appearance, and uh, I'm going to try to show you the most common one. So this is a group of disorder of the development of forebrain and midface, and we'll look at the midface afterwards. And it results from a failure of differentiation of midline, and midline cleavage of the protencephaly. It affects the anterior infantile bone, the deep gray nuclei, the olfactory region. It's not that uncommon, 1 to 2 per 10,000. The ALO bar form is something that everyone has diagnosed. The low bar is much harder to recognize. Uh, it can be associated with price 13, 18, triploidy, and the water, and there are multiple genes that have been uh, recognized to be involved in the So. These are the different types. So if we start with the normal here, or compared to that, the most abnormal one is the ALO bar holoprotencephaly. This is the most severe form. Uh, there is no intermetric fissure and no force in those baby, and they have a undifferentiated ventricle that you can see over here that bridge both sides. There is no third ventricle, and the roof of the ventricular cavity, uh, which is normally covered by the brain, may balloon out to form a cyst. And we'll see how this is divided into a pancake, a cup, and a bowl form in the next few slides. The next uh, more severe is the similar bar form. In the similar bar form, you have a partial posterior separation of the ventricle. So there's an attempt to separate them, but the front is still merged together. And the roof of the ventricle cavity, which is normally overlaid, also may balloon in the front. Now we move to the low bar form, and the low bar form is the least severe form. There's almost normal separation in the hemisphere, but there's some fusion of the ventricle here in the middle. There is no cavum septum pellucidum, there is no uh, olfactory bulbs and tuck, and the corpus callosum may be absent or hypoplastic or normal. Now compared to this form, there is a more recently uh, dis uh, described form called Syntelicephaly about 20 years ago, and this is also called the middle intermesic uh, variant. And here, this is an intermediate form between the low bar and the ALO bar variety. There's more differentiation in the frontal lobe than in the ALO bar, and there's one single ventricle. Uh, there's also some posture uh, uh, 
differentiation. But most characteristically, the Syrian fissure seemed to extend from one lobe, one hemisphere to the other hemisphere. So it's mostly in the middle portion of the brain you see the defect, which is a reason it's called the uh, middle interesting variant. And there's, there's a very rare form, the holodesencephaly, in which the frontal horns are well developed. Uh, there's absence of the septum they have hydrocephaly, and they have fused fornices in the coronal section. But I don't have a picture of that for natally. So, remember the, the week three to four, as Nguyen uh, has mentioned, is the dorsal induction, and week five to ten is the ventral induction, in which segmentation of the brain uh, occurs. You have the uh, division of the uh, prosencephalon, and you also have formation of the brain of the face. Remember, the undersurface of the neural tube here is going to be inducing the formation of the face. So, normally you should have the uh, initial vesicle that has a cleavage, and then the two lateral for rotating wall. You have proper lateralization developing normal ventricle. If you have failure of cleavage, you will have failure of inward rotation, and that will cause the fused ventricle and the dorsal sac with a single ventricle that we typically see when we do the uh, ALO bar form of what it was in separately. So let's start with ALO bar, which is the one that we see the most easily. You can start, start recognizing that very early on. And these are babies that have a big cyst inside the head and importantly you should not see an intermesophic fissure so look for a thin incomplete brain and we'll talk in just a second between the pancake, the cup and the bowl there's a monoventricle with communication with the closed cyst the thalami are fused there are no corpus callosum, no folds, no intermesophic fissure in those babies This is a lethal uh, condition associated with some major uh, facial anomalies also. So this is the, the three type. In the pancake form, you have brain which is just at the uh, most uh, inferior portion with a big cyst above that. And this is when you see the dorsal image, a large cyst and just a little edge of brain in the most uh, caudal portion. This is the pancake. This is the cup here. So now the brain is extending and covering the frontal region, but not covering the entire region. And this is what you see in this large sun image, uh, with the frontal portion being developed, but the back is missing. And then the last thing is a bowl form, in which there's a thin layer of brain all around, a large cyst. Uh, and this is more common in semi-noba cephaly. So here are a few examples. You see communication of the ventricle from one side to the other. Uh, you can recognize that pretty early on. This is a case we had at 11 weeks. This is another case at 12 weeks. Uh, this is something which is recognizable when you do nuclear uh, translucent screening, for instance. Here are some other cases in which we did the dissection of the uh, uh, ventricles by doing an inversion. And you can see the big ventricle going from one side to the other side. And you can do this, uh, it's a bit tedious to do, but you can do this at different gestational age. Now, if you section this ALO bar holo process simply at different level, at the top here, you have this large communication. You go more in the middle, you have the cup form, and here you get the bottom portion, and you see the fused thalami at this level. Another example uh, from Nguyen here, this is the bowl form, you see the communication between one side and the other, you see the frontal portion, you see the fused thalami over here, and the big ventricle that goes from one side to the other form. Okay, so the bowl form because it covers, it has a coverage all over. This is another baby that has a pancake form, so here we dissect the 
the skull, and here we have the brain. You see the frontal portion of the brain is present, but the most posterior portion is absent. This is a view from the back of the baby. You see the fused thymi over here, and you see the rim of cortex, which is anterior, but is not present on the posterior aspect, and uh, this is therefore the NK4. Now let's move to the semilobar holopus encephaly, and then is where we start getting into trouble. Uh, because on the drawing it looks easy to recognize, but in real life, the differential diagnosis between lobar holopus encephaly, a genesis of the septum pellucidum, hydrocephaly with disruption of the septum pellucidum, is going to be a bit more difficult to make. Uh, drawings are simple to make a description, but in real life, it may be more difficult. So here we have the ventricles that are communicating. You can see that there's some separation between the ventricles. It's not a smooth curve like we had before. Now we have an attempt to differentiate the frontal horn, uh, but not a complete version. And of course, this baby also have a very poor neurological outcome. Now we move to the low bar cholecosencephaly, and the low bar cholecosencephaly is also going to present some trouble because we have <coughs> attempts of division here. We don't have an intermissive fissure, we don't have a force, so we may have a hypoplastic force, uh, but uh, it is not a complete force, and so we have to recognize that. So one of the criteria that is recently published is the presence of the snake under the skull. This is the fused anterior cerularis that are running in a groove under the skull in this location here. This is not an artery that we see normally. The uh, anterior cerularis are not typically visible in this shape here. So that is something you may want to do when you do cardiopera in a sagittal section uh, on this baby. Now here we have well-developed frontal horn. You see they're well separated. We have an intermissive fissure here, uh, but the ventricle do communicate with one another uh, at this level. Another example, you see a development of the frontal horn, and you can see that they communicate together, and there is no corpus callosum, uh, and there is there's an anterior corpus callosum, but we have no give him some tuberculosum, the portion of the anterior corpus callosum, but the body is thinned out and is missing. So, a genesis of corpus callosum is not always complete, you may have this genesis. This is two different babies to show you the difference between fused and cleave thymar. Uh, we'll talk about fused thymar in the uh, ALO bar, and here we have cleaved uh, thymar, but still one big monoventricle. Now, this could be easily confused if you read fast. This looks like you can see the cerebral peduncles, but this is not a normal anterior complex. We don't see the cavum septum pellucidum, we don't see the genu of the corpus callosum. So, watch out for this kind of images when I review those seals about holoports encephaly. It is usually this kind of form here where you see some frontal horns, but those frontal horns don't have a normal shape. They don't meet in the middle with the cavum septum pellucidum. So this is an image that is easy to mistake and uh, it causes some lawsuits. Now, lobar corpus encephaly is not meaningful, but they have profound mental regionalization and neurological problems, and hydrocephalus is commonly associated with the uh, lobar corpus encephaly. Now let's move to the synenthetically, uh, synenthetically or the middle hemisphere fissure, uh, middle hemisphere variant. So here we have fusion of the hemisphere in the middle, so we don't have a separation, and we have kind of merging of the uh, sylvan fissure from one side to the other. These will also have this genesis of the corpus callosum, and they may have partial separation of the thalamus. So it's a rather complex form. Uh, to recognize, and there are several articles that have been published recently in the literature. So here we see the frontal horn, they are diverging, but they are merging in the middle. You see that fused over here, we don't have a cavum septum pellucidum, we have a cleaved uh, thymus here, uh, you see the frontal horn here, so no cavum septum pellucidum, merging of the two, and uh, the particular shape in the uh, uh, frontal aspect with the communication in between. 
This is another example. You see the distended posterior horn, uh, the wide anterior horn, but they are communicating. Again, we don't have a given septopolistum, and in this baby, there is no uh, corpus callosum that is visible. Another example, large natural ventricle. You see the fusion of the two ventricles, uh, and more separate in the uh, superior aspect, more fused in the inferior aspect, again, syntenocephaly. Another example here from Moshe Bernstein, you see the two thiamide that are separate, and this, you see there is a partial uh, intermittent fissure here in false, so uh, this is a way to recognize it from the other form of hologencephaly. Hologencephaly, uh, there is no prenatal diagnosis that I know of. What you look for is wide uh, communication here. There's obstructive for hydrocephalus and fused forces that produce this echogenic dot in the middle of the coronal section. Now, let's look at the facial anomaly in holoprosent separately, uh, because that is an important aspect in the differential diagnosis of hydrocephalus. You don't only look at the brain, you always, always look at the face to see what kind of anomaly you can see. So this portion here of the precordal plate is going to be the portion that induces the formation of the face. And of course, you could expect the sonic hedgehog is going to be involved into that. And it set the median line for the face, it divides the forebrain into two separate hemispheres, and it divides the eye field into uh, two uh, fields also. So, this failure of division here is going to cause a failure of division of the face. And it will go to some great difference between synoptomic uh, cyclopia, which is what you see over here, to hypotenorous and enlarged orbits. The nose can either be a proboscis with one or two nostrils, or we'll see the difference in just a second. Of course, absence of the nasal bone. And in the forehead, you may have absence of the metopic suture and a hypoplastic maxilla. They can go to complete absence. So let's look at the different form that we'll see. So if we compare to the normal uh, uh, fetus here, in hypotelorism, you see that the two eyes are closer. Uh, you may have also microcephaly in those baby. You may have a cleft palate, so you want to do a cross section of the upper dental arch. And this is, I think, very difficult to see. You can have a single maxillary incisor. So if you look at the teeth, but you can try to see that there's an asymmetrical number. But this is really difficult. The hypertelorism is the easiest thing to recognize. Remember that you can measure hypertelorism, but you can also just eyeball it. The distance between the orbit should be equal to the orbital diameter. So if you have the distance between the orbit equal or less than the orbit, you have hypertelorism. The next more severe here is sibocephaly. In sibocephaly, you have a proboscis-like nose, but it has only one nostril. So instead of two nostril, look for one nostril, and that is something which is better done uh, either with some tangential section of the ultrasound or with 3D reconstruction. The next further up step is the median cleft. So now we have a cleft in the middle of the mouth, not on the lateral side like we have in the orofacial cleft. It's in the middle of the mouth and it extends into the nose. Very characteristic. The next further step is the ethmocephaly. Now we don't have the nose in the proper position. It is replaced by a proboscis which is above the eyes and the eyes typically are either fused together or they are extremely close together. In the case of Staclopia, the eyes are fused together, have a single orbit, and then the worst situation is autocephaly, in which now we have a complete disruption of the first branchial arch, and you have an abnormal midline position of the ears that are fixed in the middle of the, uh, of the neck. The mouth is very hypoplastic or not visible, and the eyes are also abnormal. So let me show you some example of this different form of facial anomalies that you can see in holoposencephaly. So here we have a case of hypotelorism. If you look at the distance between the eyes, 
again, the distance is closer than the orbital down here. Another case of Nguyen that told you this is a, a lecture in which she has contributed a great number of cases. Here's an example in which I think it's interesting to look at the 3D compared to the 2D. If you look at the 3D, you may say, hmm, cute little baby. But actually, when you look at the 2D, you see that clearly the interocular distance here is less than the orbital diameter. So this baby clearly has hypotelorism. This is a baby which otherwise has hypotelorism, which is not seen on this particular image. Another example now, this is Cebocephaly. We have a nose that has a single nostril. A single nostril is visible here, and it's visible here on 3D. Also, this baby has hypotelorism, but again, I prefer a cross-section for the eyes instead of the 3D reconstruction to look for hypotelorism. So this is Cebocephaly, and now we have the median cleft syndrome. So now we have a nose that is connected to the mouth by a wide gap. You see this wide gap, and that gap is exactly central. It's not going from one nostril to the mouth, it's going from both nostril or the single nostril to the mouth. And of course, this is associated very much with trisomy 18 and 13, median cleft uh, syndrome. Another example, you can see this big gap in between. Uh, you see there's also some mid-face hypoplasia. The mid-face is displaced posteriorly. Uh, you can see the gap here in the clean uh, lip, and there's also a gap in the uh, palate at this level. So they also have mid-face hypoplasia and this retrial position of the uh, mid-face. Here's another case from Gwyn, and you see a baby has ethnocephaly. You see this one has two nostrils. Uh, you see the nostrils over here, and you see the fused eye under the nostril. So this is similar to the uh, drawing here. This is a case of ethnocephaly. <coughs> Next here is another ethnocephaly. You see the two orbits here are fused together, but you can see the two lens are separate. Uh, you can see the proboscis over here, uh, typical of ethnocephaly. Another example of ethnocephaly, you see the fusion of the two orbits. You see the two orbits are close together, that are partially fused. Another example here, another ultrasound image of that over here. This, these are rather uh, easy to recognize prenatally. So when you do a diagnosis of suspicion of holoprosencephaly, always look at the face. Another example here, you can see the two eyes very close to each other over here. You see the holoprosencephaly. You see the two orbits here are next to each other and the effect at this level. Another example here with proboscis and synophthalmia. You see the eyes are merged in the middle, and the proboscis is over the single orbit here. And then uh, here we have a baby that has a sensibilo cephalocele and hypotelorism. You see there's something protruding in front of the face in between the orbits, and the baby has hypotelorism. And of course, the head it also had uh, a lobar holoprosencephaly, so multiple facial anomaly associated with them. And now the most extreme form is the autocephaly or the ignatia holoprosencephaly. You see the orbits are difficult to recognize. There's a tiny dot here for the mouth, and the ears are fused in the midline over here. This is another example here with the eyes a bit more visible. Uh, the nose is in the midline here, and the uh, ears are fused in the midline. So this is the typical finding that you see in autocephaly or the Ignatia holoprosencephaly version. So this is what I wanted to show you about holoprosencephaly, and now I'm going to finish by going to the septoptic dysplasia. And septoptic dysplasia is very hard to recognize for holoprosencephaly. So if you look at the condition that have absence of the septum pellucidum, there will be two types of disorder. One, which is the septum optic dysplasia, that has no septum pellucidum and hypoplastic optic nerve and chiasma and, and pituitary hypoplasia. 
And then the other condition, which is an isolated absence of the symptom criticism, like be careful that 25% of baby in which we believe there is absence of the septum pellucidum, which is isolated, 25% of this baby postnatally have septoptic dysplasia. So this is really a diagnosis that you have to handle with a great amount of care because we have a tendency to miss um, findings when we do the examination. So let's start with the septoptic dysplasia. And you see the big different diagnosis here is going to be with holoprosensivity. And it's difficult to recognize one from the other. So, absence of the septum pellucidum is important. Hypoplasia of the optic nerve or optic chiasma. And I don't know how many of you can do that, but you can do some 3D reconstruction of the optic uh, chiasma in the second portion of the uh, second trimester. And this is a very difficult thing to do. And very few people in the world can do that. Uh, I have tried to do some myself, uh, but I don't have the technical skill most of the time. There's some mutation or uh, different genes that can do that. This is a rare anomaly. It has a low recurrence rate, but it may be associated with other anomalies. Schizencephaly, quite typical, 70% may have bilateral uh, schizencephaly. And of course, the prognosis there will be related to the schizencephaly more than the septoptic dysplasia. You can have pre-sylvian uh, polymacrogyra, which is something that is usually seen after birth, not prenatally, but you can see the smooth cortex on some of these babies. The holoprosencephaly, the septoptic dysplasia, and low bar holoprosencephaly overlap very much. Sometimes you need postnatal MRI to recognize. They will have ventricular megaly, dysgenesis of the corpus callosum. They may have craniofacial anomaly, and then they will have multiple endocrine functions. So, not only the anatomy, but the physiology of this baby is going to be abnormal, which prenatally does not affect them, but of course it's going to be important in the management of those babies uh, if the patient continues the pregnancy. So, the finding here, this is a normal exam compared to the baby that had a subductive displeasure. You see the absence of the uh, cavum septum pellucidum. Remember, absence of something is always harder than demonstrating the presence. There will be fusion of the frontal horn at this level. The corpus callosum may be present, but it may be thinner. So you have to look at a central section over here. The force is seen normally. So that's uh, a differential diagnosis with the holoprosencephaly. And this baby will present with ventricular megaly. So these are the key findings that you have to search when you're looking at this baby. Now here's an example of low bar holoprosencephaly. You see there is some uh, division of the cortex at this level, but you don't have the forks. You see here, in septoptic dysplasia, the forks is present aside from the division. So this is a different type of entity, and this is one of the criteria. But however, you see they both have absence of the symptom pellucidum, and they both have merging and fusion of the uh, uh, frontal horn. So if you see a baby that has a corpus callosum, go more with the diagnosis of septoptic dysplasia than with uh, low bar holoprosencephaly. Now, they are both similar because they are missing the cavum septum pellucidum, but in septoptic dysplasia, you don't have the optic chiasma. And this is an example of a dissection of the optic chiasma uh, one, one of my friends in uh, Moscow, and she is very skilled at recognizing the optic chiasma. And not only you can find it, but then you can measure it. And here the measurement is very simple. The optic nerve size should be the gestational age divided by 10. So if you have a 20 week fetus, it should be 2 millimeter. If you have a 36 week fetus, it should be 2, 3.6 millimeter. Now, for those of you who are experts, uh, at doing some 3D dissection. If you have good optic charisma, please send them to me because I would include them uh, because not so many people can do that. So, when it's associated with holoprosencephaly, the schizencephaly, the prognosis is going to be poor and reflect the prognosis of the associated anomalies of holoprosencephaly or schizencephaly. When it is isolated and not simply absence of the cavum septum pollution, so you have optic chiasma uh, atresia, but you don't have uh, 
just a simple given second ballistic absence, then the outcome will use will have visual impairment, hypopituitarism, cerebral palsy, and development delay. So even if the condition is as favorable as possible, the prognosis for this baby is very poor. This is a baby we had a couple of years ago. Uh, you see there is a wide interamnesophic fissure. Uh, the corpus callosum was absent in this baby. It was merging of the ventricle. She also has an interventricular bleed. Uh, and she survived a few years. You see the facial appearance is quite normal compared to autoprosencephaly. Uh, but she had intractable uh, epilepsy and associated uh, hormonal deficiency. So she could not survive. Here's another example where you have some borderline size of the lateral ventricle. They measure 12 milliliters. There is no cavum septum pellucidum. You see the absence of the cavum septum pellucidum and the merging of the frontal horns. Here you can see a portion of the intermissary fissure. You see that the corpus callosum is present on the front, but look at the thickness of the corpus callosum here and the thickness of the corpus callosum there. So this baby has an irregular corpus callosum. So uh, pay attention not only to the presence of the corpus callosum, but to the morphology of the corpus callosum. So here again, absent cavum septum pellucidum, you have merging of the two uh, ventral in front of each other, you have an intact force, and you have uh, fused anterior horns. And now let's move to the isolated absence of the septum pellucidum, and this is something which you have to treat very carefully because 25% of the cases that have been reported in literature as being absent by cavum septum ultimately end up having a septum optic dysplasia. So we underrepresent the septum optic dysplasia in this group. Now these baby, even if they have everything normal, we have an anomaly of the limbic structure. They may have heterotopia, so you want to look alongside the ventricle to see if you have an irregular size of the ventricle, if you have nodules. They may have a hypoplastic forks and they may have ventricular cleft. So they're not out of the woods because you can see the uh, uh, absence that is isolated. So here's an example uh, where there is absence of the equivalent to lucidum. The frontal horn are merging in the uh, uh, midline here. You see the corpus callosum over here. And that baby was followed for several years. And by the time the baby was 14 months, all MRI had been normal, or the uh, physical development and the neurological development of the child was normal, and there was no endocrine function. So this confirmed the fact that this was an isolated absence and not a septoptic dysplasia. This is another example. Here you can see the merging of the ventricles over here. You can see the corpus callosum and no septum pellucidum in between. So this is a well-established case. So this is what I wanted to talk to you about in the ventral induction. So thank you very much for your attention. Central defects are divided into three groups. A hole in the middle of the interventricular septum. This is called a septum secundum defect. For those of you who didn't like embryology, now is the time to go back and understand why there's a septum primary and a septum secundum. If the hole is close to the crux of the heart, we talk about a septum primum defect. And then there's a third category in which the holes are close to the vena uh, cava. And these are called sinus venosus defect. And then that's something that we see very commonly. So the most important here is the secundum and the primum uh, defect. Now, intercepal defect are rather common analyses, but I bet very few of you have ever detected one because they are hard to detect and uh, so we tend to miss them. They are associated with many other cardiac lesions. Ventricular septal defect, we have stenosis and many complex defects resulting in interarial shunts. 
Another common one is called Turan syndrome. If the mother of the baby has a missing finger, missing thumb, or she has a triphalangeal thumb, thing that the baby has also called her own syndrome. So the funding in the fortune of you is if you have an osteoporotic defect, you have missing the crux between, you're missing the segment between the crux of the heart and the foramen of valley, and I'll show this to you in some images. If you have a septum secundum, this is much more tricky because they are located at the level of the foramen of valley, so they are actually the foramen of valley, which is a bit too large. So the big clue here is you're missing the foramen of value flap. Remember when we looked at the four chamber yesterday, I told you, look at the motion of the foramen of value flap and make sure that it's present. Now, this is the type that we see in most common, the osteum secundum, when you have a very large form. When you don't see any interatrial septum, this is typically the osteum secundum, and the sinus venosus are rare, and we don't really see them very often. So here we have a four chamber, and there's a big communication between the right and the left. Same thing over here, same thing over here. This is the complete form of osteum secundum. And when you put color doppler, you can see continuity of the doppler signal between the two. This is a segment here in the normal heart, which is missing in the osteum primum defect. So in osteum primum, you will see this section of the uh, interanal sector, but you will not see this section here. So here's a large communication between the two atria. This is a baby that has a partial trisomy 10p and a partial monosomy uh, 4p, but you could have something similar in baby that have trisomy 21. So large communication between the two atria. Now we move on to the ventricle septal defect, and the ventricle septal defect are typically classified into four different groups. You may have a membranous septal defect or you can have a trabecular or muscular septal defect. These are the ones that we see the most commonly. You can have an inlet defect or you can have an outlet defect. And it's not always easy to recognize the difference between an outlet defect, a membranous ventricle septal defect, and an inlet defect. So you may have some uh, hesitation and you may kind of mix them together, but you can recognize them easily from the trabecular or muscular septal defect. Now, ventricular septal defect are extremely common, so they essentially associate with everything else. So they are not the kind of thing in which you always say, I ventricular septal defect, so what else should I be looking? You should be looking at the entire baby, not only the heart, but the rest of the baby, because they have association with an employee. So here's an inlet defect. You see a gap over here. You see the communication between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. This is a very large defect. Here you have the same thing, and you also notice that the AV valve at the same level. So you have a large inlet defect at this level. Now we're moving into the muscular defect, and this is a very large muscular defect here. Usually they're not so big, and usually they're not as visible on a grayscale image. You have to use color in order to see them. And this is an example in color. You can see the interventional septum here, and there is a flash of color at the end. I'm going to replay this clip, and notice that when you don't have the color, it's almost impossible to see this defect. There's a tiny defect, but it's much better to see with color. So I want to urge you that every time you do a four chamber, you have to put color if your machine has it. You paid a lot of money to get this color button on your keyboard. Use it, okay? So look for that. Other example, if anyone can see the defect here, you are much better than me. I don't see the defect. Let me replay the color clip here, and you see the defect here. What is the color of the flow in the defect? Is it blue or is it red? It's blue and red. What does that mean? It means it's bidirectional. Ventricular septal defect in the child are always unidirectional. They go from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. In the fetus, that's not true. They go from the left ventricle to the right ventricle during systole, but they go from the right ventricle to the left ventricle during diastole. So fundamentally for the fetus, it really doesn't matter they have a ventricular septal defect. So you're not going to see that this baby is floppy or has high drugs because of ventricular septal defect. You have to really look at the anatomy. Another example here, you can see blue in one direction, red in the other direction, and you can see that in grayscale, 
there's just a little line here which will be very easy uh, to be missing. So be careful about this. Another example, you can see the jet over here quite clearly. And if you don't have the color at the proper time, you may easily be missing it. So in practice, what you do, you do the four chamber, you adjust the uh, uh, color doppler, and then you get a little click, and then you go frame by frame for at least one or two cardiac cycles. Uh, you don't have to have 20 cycles, this is too tedious. If you have two or three cardiac cycles, and you see the defect in the same portion of the cycle at each time, you have made the diagnosis. Some people are very obsessive, and they even try to get a pulse wave doppler in the defect. That is too time consuming, and we don't have the time to do this. Here's a premium British uh, septal defect at this level. Here's another one. And you see this is very similar to the inlet defect that I showed you before. And here, many other ventricular septal defect. Okay, so a rather common type of anomaly. Here we have one just under the aorta, subaortic defect, the kind of thing you can see in babies that have to charge you find out. Here's another one, you can see the left outflow tract, this is in blue, and under the blue you see this little red jet, which is just coming over here, and so you have a defect just under the aorta, so subaortic defect. Now I'll show you this bit four here, so I'm going to skip that. So, prognosis and management, usually they are asymptomatic in the neonatal period. A great majority of them will actually spontaneously close. Uh, so, it's kind of good because if you miss it and the baby doesn't come with a BSD, no one is ever going to blame you for that. But you want to also rule out associated anomaly, uh, and particularly aneuploidies, and if there is none, then you use the standard obstetric management. And now we move to the combined atrial and ventricular septal defect. These used to be called endocardial cushion defect, and they're also called atrial ventricular canal, but the preferred terminology is now atrial ventricular septal defect. And they're divided into two groups, an incomplete form in which there is tethering of the valve over the crest of the septum, and this allows to have all sorts of atrial to atrial, atrial to ventricle, and ventricle to ventricle, uh, communication. And then there's a complete form in which there is nothing in the middle of the heart and this can be further subdivided and I'll show you uh, later. And then we have one large anterior leaflet and one large posterior leaflet. If we compare the basal view of the heart with the uh, aortic valve here, the mitral and the tricuspid valve, in the incomplete form we may have clefting of the mitral valve which is very difficult to see prenatally and you have this abnormal shape of the tricuspid valve. And they are at the same level. This is what is important in, in the four chamber view. This two AV valve would be at the same level instead of having the tricuspid, which is closer to the apex. Now in the complete form, you have several leaflet, but two predominant leaflet. You have the superior bridging leaflet and the inferior bridging leaflet, which is over here. And so when you have diastole, the two leaflet will be away from each other and you have a big open gap in the middle of the heart. So the complete form has been subdivided into an A, B and C form. This is a massive classification. In the type A you have an anterior leaflet that is divided into equal parts. There's a cleft in between here and they have peppery muscle attachment to the tricuspid side of the heart, so the right side. And this is typically associated with baby that have left-sided obstruction. In the time B, which is much more uncommon, you have a papillary muscle, the remnant of the septal uh, papillary muscle of the tricuspid valve that has a coated tendony that attached to both part of the leaflet. And then in the type C, you have no attachment whatsoever. So you can see a leaflet and no coated tendony going to the general receptor, and this is the one that is associated with the tertiary fragility. So here we have a large septal, large leaflet. You see it's attached here on the side of the septum. This is the complete form in a baby who has trisomy 21. So you find h receptor defect, the complete form. The predominant thinking you have is with trisomy 21. 
He has a younger baby, also as far as we're 21, 14 week. You see the big gap in the center, and you see this large floppy uh, valve that is bridging over the two ventricles. Now, what are the findings of the four chamber view? In the complete form, you have this bridging AV valve, you have a shorted temporary septum, and you see here the corded tenue going onto the right side of the septum. So this is a rest of the testification type A. In the uh, baby here, oh, sorry, I think I'm missing something here. Okay, here we have the uh, big AV valve. You can see that the uh, ostium uh, secundum is present. The ostium primum is missing. We have a defect below the uh, foramen of valley to the crux of the heart. We still the foramen, We still see the foramen of valley flaps. So we have ostium primum defect, which is the one associated with the atrioventricular defect. We have a ventricular defect on the other side, and we have a large bridging AV valve over the two ventricles. Another example over here, you can see a large common atrium, you can see a large interventricular septal defect, and you see the membrane, you see the uh, anterior leaflet which is attached here to the right side and the apex of the septum. Again, a rusty type A. In the uh, four chamber, for the incomplete form, this is a bit more difficult to recognize because if you don't pay attention to the position of the tricuspid and the AV valve, you're missing the big criteria. So that is the important thing to recognize, that the two AV valves are attached to the same level instead of having an offset between the two. Now, if you're really good and you have a baby that is very cooperating, you can see the cleft of the, mi uh, the uh, mitral valve, but I've never seen an example of that. So here we go into the uh, four chamber. You can see this big bridging gap on both sides, and you see the classical image of this inflow that looks like a Y into the uh, two ventricles at the same time. You see this during diastole flow enters from both atria to both ventricles at the same time with this division at this level. Another example, you can see this big bridging valve. You can see still part of the foramen of the flap, but you almost don't see the interatrial foramen anymore. And you can see during diastole with card arbor that blood is going into both ventricles at the same time. So that makes the diagnosis quite easy. This is an early fetus. Uh, you can see the baby also has an important finding: is the heart rate is too slow. Babies that have atrial ventricular defect are missing portion of the uh, septum on which the atrial ventricular <coughs> node, the atrial uh, node is, and so they have conduction delay and they have a slow heartbeat. You see the crest of the septum, remember I told you yesterday to look for this white echo that tells you that this is not a drop heart artifact, and you see the big valve that is opening over both uh, ventricles. Another example here, you see the uh, bottom of the septum primum over here, and you see the gap in between, right ventricle, left ventricle, and the over uh, valve. Another example here, you see big defect, the same thing all the time. So it's easy to recognize there's nothing doing nicely, so this is the complete form, and if you have any doubt, you do call a doctor, and you see the inflow into two ventricles that are merged in the middle of the heart. Now this is a bit more difficult. You could be looking at this and say, oh, this is a normal four chamber, apex and uh, uh, descending aorta on the same side. But if you look carefully, you see that those two AV valves are at the exact same level. Okay, so this is a very important finding to look at. If you see the two AV valves at the same level, this is not a normal heart. This is a baby that has the incomplete form of atrial receptor defect. On the clip on the right side here, you can also see two AV valves at the same level. This is a much younger fetus, I think about 12, 14 weeks, and you don't see very much in this heart, but you can see it has this irregular uh, bradycardic rate. You do transvaginal, and you can see the interruption of the intermediate receptor, 
and they're bridging an AV valve over the two ventricles. So you've made the diagnosis of atrial receptor defect, it's first trimester baby, this baby has trisomy 21 until proven otherwise. Now sometimes you can make the diagnosis not but even looking at the heart. This is a regurgitation in the right atrium at the inferior nerve cava. And what you see on this side of the tracing is the ventricular rhythm. On this side you see the atrial rhythm. And you can see clearly that the atrial rhythm is regular. But the ventricular rhythm is very irregular. And more than that, the atrial and the ventricular rhythm are not correlated. There's a complete atrial ventricular block between one and the other. And not only that, but you can see that when some very big <laughs> ventricular contraction, you interrupt the atrial uh, flow, so you have a large amount of regurgitation. So even from this simple image, you can deduct that the baby has the complete form, and therefore most likely trisomy 21. The differential diagnosis is with the univentricular heart, sorry, and the partial form, you can also think about the persistence of the left supernic cava with dilatation of coronary sinus. So, what are the associated anomalies? Multiple cardiac anomalies, uh, tachycardia, bradycardia mostly, high drops because the heart is pumping inefficiently, and then you have a whole bunch of other anomalies that are essentially anomalies related to the aneuploidies. Atrial ventricular septal defect being related to aneuploidy, trisomy 18 and 21, all these associated anomalies, diaphragm hernia, dunotresia, uh, omphanocele will be associated with atrial receptor defect. And then also isomeries will have uh, some uh, atrial receptor defect. Prognosis and management, very poor prognosis. The prenatal uh, mortality is 14 to 22 percent, and the postnatal outcome depends on whether there is some associated anomaly or not. So what you want to do is make sure that there's an isolated finding with nothing else affecting the fetus. Check for development of a heart failure because a baby that has an atrial ventricular defect and a heart failure almost always die. And otherwise you do the standard obstetrical management. So to summarize that, atrial septal defect, too big for osteum primum, you're missing the segment between the foramen of radio flat and the crux of the heart. Ostium secundum, you're missing the foramen of radio flat. For the ventricular septal defect, four forms, all the inlet, outlet, and membranous are easy to confuse, but they're easy to differentiate from the muscular or trabecular form. Always do cardiopter to see the uh, transfer of the blood by uh, doing systole and diastole. And then the atrial ventricular septal defect, the big clue is make sure that the two valves are at the same level. This is the incomplete form. And if you don't see anything in the middle of the heart, the baby has the complete form. So this one I had to show you for the uh, septal defect. And uh, I'm going to save time by going directly into the ventricular anomaly. And Kim Lohan is going to talk to you about the D transposition and the L transposition. And so I'm going to talk to you mostly about tetralogy of Fado. And during the rest of the time that I have, I'd like to show you some of the heterotaxy because we have been talking about heterotaxy yesterday. And I also want to show you some of the venous anomaly uh, because I have mentioned to you the uh, uh, anomalous pulmonary venous return and the persistent yeah. 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 So let's go back into the conotrunkal anomaly and let me show you about tetralogy of Fado. This is Fado, who was a French physician, and he's actually not the one who described that uh, originally. Uh, it was called the blue disease before uh, his description, but he crystallized all the findings, and since then the description has been associated with his name. Now, if you compare to the normal heart, in tetralogy of Fado, you have one single problem, which is the malalignment of the infundibular septum and the muscular portion. So these two segments here did not align properly. And this caused three problems. First, there's a gap in between, so you have a ventricular septal defect. There's an overriding of the aorta, and there's a restriction to the pulmonary inflow. So this tetralogy of Fido is a combination of a sub-aortic ventricular septal defect, an aortic valve overriding the defect, 
and inflammatory homoestenosis, and hypertrophy of the right ventricle, which is not something we see prenatally. This is something that is a postnatal finding. So this is a rather common disorder. Five to seven percent of all congenital heart disease are tetralogy of failure. So you will see some if you do any kind of number of scans. And it's associated with extra cardiac anomaly in a good proportion of the cases. Vectoral anomaly, if you see a baby that has a spine that has a curve in the spine, a uh, hemi vertebra, remember this is the VA vertebral anomaly, and the C is cardiac anomaly, so tetralogy of so associate these together. Uh, you can also have gastrointestinal anomaly, central nervous system anomaly, skeletal anomaly, look for trisomy 21, 18, and then the macro deletion 22Q11. So multiple things to think about. Now sometimes you can have other cardiac anomaly, including an atrial septal defect, that is called a fatal issue of cartel, atrial ventricular septal defect, the one we just looked at a second ago, atrial ventricular block, persistent nestopony cava, ectopia cordis, anomalies of segmentation of the aorta, like um, coartation or tubular narrowing, or absence of the pulmonary valve or pulmonary artery, which is actually a form of tetralogy in itself. So the tetralogy that I'm showing here is a classical tetralogy. 85% of tetralogy of Fredo will present like that. Now, 13% of them, you will have a further progression in which the pulmonary hypoplasia becomes a uh, pulmonary atresia and at that time there will be no further forward flow in the pulmonary artery and you will have pulmonary atresia. This is called the critical tetralogy of Fredo. Now don't be disappointed if you do an 18 week exam and you make this nice diagnosis of tetralogy of Fredo and when the baby is born he does not have tetralogy of Fredo. Instead it has pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect. Well, you didn't make a mistake. This is just a normal evolution of the disease. The tetralogy of Fredo has evolved into the pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect. And then less commonly, you will have an absent pulmonary valve, and I'll show you the difference when we uh, have finished this segment here. So what's abnormal in this fortune review here? I want to hear two findings. How about the axis of the heart? Is the axis of the heart normal? Remember, it should be 45 degree to the anterior posterior line. This is almost 80 degree. Okay, so the baby has left axis deviation. What else is abnormal? Yeah, the descending aura is not descending on the left side. This descending aura is descending on the right side. Okay, very important. Left axis deviation and right descending aura. This is a quadratrunkle anomaly until proven otherwise. Now, do you see a ventricular septal defect? Not always. The ventricular septal defect is easier to see when you go into the left alpha trap. So here, look for the interventricular septum angle and look for a right descending aorta. Now, here we have a four chamber that looks quite normal. We don't see the septal defect very well. And you have to really go into the uh, outflow trap view and the three vessel view. And when you get into the three vessel view, what you typically see is a large aorta with a thin pulmonary next to it. You see, remember the line I showed you yesterday that goes from the front of the pulmonary to the superlane cava? That line should be in front of the aorta. Here, the aorta is in front of the line, so we have a thin pulmonary and a large aorta. Here in the outflow track, what you see very typically is the break in the ballerina foot. I'm going to show you the ballerina foot yesterday. You see clearly the leg of this ballerina is not going to this foot. This leg here is pointing at, is aiming at the interventricular septum, and you can see a white dot here at the crest of the septum. So we have an overriding aorta, and this aortic valve is above both vertical. Now there's some subtle thing here because if the aortic valve is overriding the septum by 50%, it's called tetralogy of Renault. If it's overriding by 51%, a bit more to the right side, 
It's fundamentally the same physiology, but now it changed name. It's called double outlet right ventricle. So be aware of that so that when you diagnose the tertiary of Fredo, think to see what the overriding is because it could actually be double outlet right ventricle. But this is a technical detail. Fundamentally, you have made the correct diagnosis and you see both ventricle emptying in the aorta at this level. Here you can see also the aorta overriding both ventricle, and here same thing. This aorta is in front of the interventricular septum, and you see the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Now, one of the big rules of fetal echo is that you can use a lot of reasoning, so you don't have to memorize everything. Think these are rivers. If you have two rivers that are joining together, you get a bigger river. Okay, that is simple. If you have the flow of the left ventricle and the flow of the right ventricle going to the aorta, what will happen to the aorta? It will enlarge. If the aorta enlarges, what happens to the aortic valve? It enlarges also. If the aortic valve enlarges too much, what becomes of the leaflet? They become incompetent. So this is something to keep in mind, is that if you have too much flow for the aorta, the leaflet are going to be distended, and now you're going to have aortic insufficiency on top of the tetralogy of fetal. And remember what I told you yesterday, dilatation of the fetal heart depends on regurgitation more than it depends on obstruction. So if you see an aorta, like in this image on the left, on the right side, an aorta which is bigger in diameter than either of the ventricle, you know that this aorta has an aortic valve which is insufficient, and so this is going to complicate the management of this baby. So here we have overriding of the aorta, overriding, overriding. This is called the lobster claw syndrome. You can see the two like a claw of a lobster. With color Doppler, nothing very different. You see this white shape color image here. Remember, I just showed you a Y-shaped color image, but it was doing diastole in the atrium retroceptor defect, the complete form. Now this is doing systole. This is a blue one instead of being a red one like we saw in the previous uh, anomaly. Now, in the aorta, the doctor will show some high velocity. What is the maximum velocity in the aorta? Anyone brave? It's one meter per second. Eora, Bumari, and Doctors, all one meter per second. So up to 100 centimeter, here we're fine. Here, what you see in the three vessel view is very typical. You see an aorta that is larger than the pulmonary, and you see an aorta that is bulging in front of the line between the pulmonary and the supervena cava. This is a good trick. And remember, when you do the three vessel view, look to see there were the thymus is present. If the thymus is not present, you have the Dijon syndrome and the macrodeletion 22Q11. So you can also do the short axis view to compare the size of the aorta to the pulmonary, and in tetralogy of Fano, you will see a larger aorta and a smaller pulmonary. This is another three vessel view, an aorta which is massively larger than the pulmonary. And when you see that, you want to do card offer because you want to see whether the flow in the pulmonary is forward or whether it's retrograde. Okay, so important to see for the prognosis and the management of this baby. So there's an ecogenic focus here. Don't look at that. Look at the overriding, and you see the overriding over here. Same thing here, overriding and overriding over here. So very simple to recognize. Another, maybe trisomy 13 here, you see the heart shape is very globular, and you see the aura is straight in front of the interventional receptor. Another example here, now pay attention, what do you think about the AV valves here? Are they normal AV valve? No. This is a big interventional receptor defect. This is the uh, complete form of interventricular septal defect. So here we have not only tetralogy of failure, but we have a uh, complete form, and you see in the three vessel view that the pulmonary is much thinner than the aorta. Another example here, much more subtle, you see there's a small subiotic VSD, 
not very big, but you see the leg of the ballerina here is broken also. The leg is not looking at the foot, the leg is looking at the intervertebral septum. But you see this aorta here is normal size compared to the ventricle. <coughs> Okay. When you see that, the next thing you want to look at is do we see the pulmonary? And if maybe you don't see the pulmonary. If you have a doubt, you do cardiopter because if you don't see the pulmonary, it has changed name. It becomes pulmonary treasure with ventricular septal defect. Here, what do you think about the aortic valve? Is this aortic valve preventing regurgitation or not? Not at all. Huh? This aortic valve is just floating in the flow, just like a seaweed in the ocean. Okay, so this is an incompetent aortic valve. Four chamber view looks pretty normal, just a small defect over here, and you see the ballerina leg here is abnormal. It has a kink at this level, and we have overriding of the aorta. Another example with a large aorta, you see again the aortic valve here is flopping. In the, in the flow, and the aorta is bigger than either the right or the left ventricle. So a complete aortic insufficiency. Here, a four chamber that looks pretty normal. Uh, the AV valves are at the same level, so this is worrisome. And when you see the aorta, there's a small defect here, much more. So you have, have a great variation in degree of tetralogy of failure. Here's another example you can see the overriding and the aortic uh, valve. And when you go to the three vessel, same thing again, you have a large aorta and a thin pulmonary next to it. If you look at the Doppler in the pulmonary, you will have the use of Doppler to make sure that the pulmonary is patent and to assess the direction of the flow. You want to make sure that there's forward flow and not retrograde flow and you want to make sure that it's not too fast because that may be that the pulmonary valve is becoming a treading and you have turbulence in the pulmonary. For instance, here you have velocity at 180 centimeter per second. So this, is this pulmonary valve is becoming very stenotic. Here's another one with a 115 centimeter per second. So this <coughs> pulmonary valve is also getting stenotic. Uh, otherwise, when you look at cardiopter, it's mostly to see the turbulence in the ascending aura and look at the presence of the uh, pulmonary underneath the uh, aura. Same thing over here with the turbulence in the ascending aura due to the increased flow. The differential diagnosis here is pulmonary treasure with a receptor defect and uh, the trunk of saturators. So when you look for tetralogy failure, what do you look for? First, you look for left axis deviation in the four chamber, and you look for right descending aura. So that's in the four chamber. In the outflow trunk, you look for an aura that is overriding the septum by less than 50%. If it's more than 50%, you talk about double outlet right ventricle. You also want to make sure that the aortic valve is competent and not synodic, and then you want to look at the pulmonary, uh, the pulmonary artery to make sure that it's uh, patent and not retrograde flow. So let me show you the extreme form of tetralogy of Fredo, which is, um, sorry, wrong, which is uh, the absent pulmonary valve syndrome. So, here what we have is the same findings. We have a ventricular septal defect, we have an overriding aorta, but instead of having a uh, pulmonary artery which is too thin, we have a pulmonary artery which is much too large. And here the defect is the absence of the ductus arteriosus. So there is no communication between the pulmonary artery and the aortic arch. So they resemble each other, and uh, this is called one of the form of tetralogy of failure. So we don't have the ductus arteriosus, so the blood that enters into the pulmonary will have no choice but to come back into the right uh, ventricle. And remember, regurgitation is what causes enlargement. There will be a annulus of the pulmonary, which is very distended, but uh, that prevents the normal development of the pulmonary valve. So when you look at the four chamber, 
what you would see up normal here. The right side of the heart is larger. There's a pericardial infusion. The apex of the heart could be shifted to the left side. It's not really in this case. And what else is abnormal? The descending aorta again. You see the descending aorta is on the right side of the spine instead of being on the left side. So, big clue for coronary trumpal anomaly. And uh, you can see the ventricular defect, but it's not always visible in the four-channel view. So here we have the outflow track, and you see the aorta is overriding both ventricle. You see the crest of the septal defect, this little white dot over here. And when you get into the uh, outflow track, here you have this very classical image. This is a massively distended uh, pulmonary, and you see the left branch and the right branch over here, and the aura is over here. So this is quite different, and sometimes it is so big that I've had babies that have been referred for lung cyst instead of for cardiac anomalies. And uh, here you can see the main pulmonary, this is the right pulmonary, this is the left pulmonary, and you see the pulmonary valve here, which, although it is called absent pulmonary valve, it is present, it's just completely incompetent and failed to develop properly. So this is an example, you see the four chamber, you see the right alpha track, and you see this massively studied uh, pulmonary artery branching into the lung. Double finding, well you can anticipate what the double sound is going to be. You will have forward flow and you will have representation. So it's going to sound it's a very classic sound when you look at that. Here you can see the regurgitation and you can see the forward flow and the reverse flow. So remember this absent pulmonary valve syndrome. What you will see when you do the three vessel view, you will see massively distended pulmonary artery. Okay, so I wanted to quickly show you uh, the persistent left supernal cava because I showed you many examples of that yesterday. This is the heart view from the back side. And originally you had a left supernal cava, a right supernal cava, you had the vitlin vein, the cardinal vein, and the umbilical vein, and they all merge here at the level of the heart into the inferior cava, and the right super, the left supernal cava progressively disappear and is connected to the right side by the innominate vein. That's what happens in the normal embryo. In babies that have a resistant left supernal cava, then the superior cava end up draining into the coronary sinus over here and connects in this way. So this innominate vein may or may not develop and you have this long uh, superior cava that is persisting over here. So if you look at the heart from the back, this is the normal one, this is a persistent left superior cava. You have a vena cava that is in front of the pulmonary and pulmonary vein and drains in the coronary sinus over here. If you make a section at the three vessel view, you see the pulmonary vein, pulmonary artery, aorta, supernal cava, and on the left side of the pulmonary artery, you see the persistent left supernal cava. If you move your section and you go at the level of the four chamber view, you see between the left ventricle and the left atrium, you see the pulmonary artery over here. That the persistent left supernal cava. Now sometimes it can drain into the back side of the left atrium and then this is all you can see. But you have to go down further and instead of seeing the four chamber, you go all the way to the bottom to see the coronary sinus. And if you see the coronary sinus and it's distended, then you know that the persistent left supernal cava is draining in the coronary sinus. And then you think about the heterotaxis syndrome, look them up, and if you don't see a heterotaxis syndrome, it's essentially a very benign uh, anomaly. So here we have the four chamber. You see the persistent left supernal cava at this level. And when we go a little lower, you can see the communication into the coronary sinus, into the right atrium. And when we go up, we're going to go into the three vessel view. And we're going to see it on the left side of the pulmonary. Very typical. Okay, so 95% of them drain into the coronary sinus. You'll have a big coronary sinus. 5% drain into the back of the left atrium. 
And then I want to just show you some of the Hitler taxi because we mentioned that several times yesterday. And uh, I don't have much time, so I may have to go fast here. So compared to the normal side of Sonny's baby with the apex of the heart and the stomach on the left side, you also have a mirror image baby, which is a sinus inversus, heart and stomach and speed are on the right side. And then you have a number of sinus in which the heart and the stomach may not be on the same side. You may have the liver in the middle. And this is the one in which you think about the heterotaxia. Now, I'm going to skip the uh, way to identify, but there's some way to recognize the right side from the left side. There's some organs typically on the right, some organs typically on the left side. Now, in sinus inverses, let me show you just some image. Um, this is the typical image. You have apex of the heart and stomach that are both on the right side of the baby instead of being on the left side of the baby. So in heterotaxy and isomerism, what you have is an abnormal arrangement of organs or part of the body in relationship to each other. So if you have a right isomerism, you have right structures. So you will have a baby that has a normal right side, and on the left side, instead of having a left side, it has a mirror image of the right side to the left side. Think of this as being a half sinus inversus attached to a normal baby. And if you have left isomerase, you will have left structure on the left side and mirror image of the left structure on the right side. And that's a very convenient way to think because if you think that your baby has a right isomerism, all the left sided structure will be defective. If you have a baby that has left isomerism, all the right sided structure will be defective. <coughs> This used to be called Estrella and Polisplenia in the old days when I was a medical student. So let's start with left isomerism. And here we have left sided structure. So the IBC is a right sided, stru right -sided structure. So no right sided structure, no IBC. You will have uh, IBC interruption with acid discontinuation. And you will have absence of the sinus node, and so you will also have slow heartbeat in your lungs. <coughs> the anomalies include biventricular uh, anomalies with ventricular defect, atrial ventricular defect that we just discussed earlier, and the heart can be either on the right, in the middle, on the left, and AV blocks are common. So these baby have trouble when they're born. You can look at the atrial appendage. This, I have shown you this image, superior cava and no inferior cava, very classical. And the other very classical image is a section in the chest in which you see two vessels side by side. One of them is the azagos vein, and the other one is the descending aorta. Now, when you see the uh, vessel like here, we have aorta, and here we have another vessel next to it, and that is not the vena cava, as I showed you yesterday. This is the azagos vein. The vena cava should be about at the level of the O aorta here. Okay, so very different. And here, behind the fourth chamber, you see the aorta, and next to it, we don't have the IVC. The IVC should be draining into the right atrium. This is the acid discontinuation in IVC interruption. And when you do cardiopera in the chest, you see this classical image with the aorta and acid next to each other. This one is red, so it's going towards the transducer. This is the aorta. This one is blue. It's going away from the transducer. This is azicus, and that's how you can recognize one from the other. The baby will have bradycardia. The liver can be symmetrical. There can be some uh, sinus. You see the umbilical vein is entering in a straight line instead of coming with a curve. And here you can see that the stomach can be either on the left side or on the right side. The stomach is not a reliable indicator. And you can see that this stomach here is not in the normal position. The stomach should be further away, not close to the spine, like in this image here. So here we have aorta and azicus vein next to each other. Baby can have polysplenia, but this is hard to see with ultrasound. And these are the <coughs> important findings in that eye summary. So IVC interruption is really the one you want to be looking at. And then let me finish by showing you some clips. Here we have the two vessels into the uh, chest. And uh, 
the two vessels side by side in the next to the spine, very typical of IVC interruption. And when you do cardioper, you see this is the azygos arch. You see the blood is going from the back to the front. This is the azygos arch, the image I showed you yesterday. And uh, you can see the two vessels inside the chest. Now, the right eye summary is you have maybe they have two right sides. So the inferior cava, instead of being in the normal position, is going to be in front of the aura on the same side as the aura. This is very classical. If you find a juxtaposed aura uh, and IVC, this is a baby that has right eye summaries. Well, what also goes on the left side? Pulmonary veins. If you don't see the pulmonary vein returning to the left atrium, suspect the baby has right eye summaries. And this pain can be absent. So here you see the midline section. We have the aorta and inferior cava in front of the aorta. Only right eye summaries can give you that. Here again, the aorta, <coughs> inferior cava in front of the aorta and on the same side. Only right eye summaries. So here we're going to see pulmonary veins that are not returning to the left atrium. They are going at the uh, intersection between the right and the left. So anomalous pulmonary veins return. Or you can look for a vein that goes behind the heart and drains into the liver. And this is the um, barren uh, connection between the pulmonary vein and the liver. And with cardiopathy, you can see the aura going in this direction. You can see IVC going in that direction. And you can see this vein going from the chest into the liver from the anomalous pulmonary vein spur. So here you can see the aura and cava is on the same side, and you see the stomach on the other side. You see that stomach is very abnormal, and the cava and aorta are on the same side. Another example with aorta and cava on the same side. It's very typical of right eye summarism. So, for the eye summarism, remember left side, you have two left sided structures, so the right side structures are missing, IV interruption, and for the right side as a brain, Left side is missing, so the baby will have anomalous pulmonary return and will have IVC in front of the aura. Okay, this was a lot of information, but I managed to get just in time for my talk. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you, Professor Zanti, for 